Welcome to Vango Notes for Human Resource Management, 11th edition by Gary Dessler. Chapter 8, Training and Developing Employees. Section 1, Big Ideas. Do you think you know everything there is to know about anything? Would you be able to run a forklift? How about a cash register? Or what about a French fry maker? Regardless of the job, there's always something to learn. So, once employees are hired, the next step is to ensure that they know what to do and how to do it. That's the purpose of orienting and training employees. Let's start with orientation. Employee orientation provides new employees with the basic background information they need to work in your company, such as information about company rules. At a minimum, orientation should accomplish four things. First, the new employee should feel welcome and at ease. Next, he should understand the organization in a broad sense, including its past, present, culture, and vision of the future. Third, as well as key facts such as policies and procedures, the employee should be clear about what is expected in terms of work and behavior. And finally, he should begin the socialization process of understanding the firm's way of acting and doing things. It might seem very routine, but don't underestimate the importance of orientation. Without basic information about rules and policies, new employees may make time-consuming or even dangerous errors. Furthermore, orientation isn't just about rules. It's also about making the new person feel welcome and at home and part of the team. And immediately after orientation, training should begin. Training means giving new or present employees the skills they need to perform their jobs. This might mean showing a new web designer the intricacies of your site, telling a new salesperson how to sell your firm's product, or showing a new supervisor how to fill out the firm's weekly payroll sheets. The current job holder might simply explain the job to the new hire, or, at the other extreme, you might schedule a process of several weeks, including classroom or online instruction. Remember, just having high-potential employees doesn't guarantee they'll succeed. Instead, they must know what you want them to do and how you want them to do it. If they don't, they'll improvise or do nothing productive at all. In fact, training has an impressive record of influencing organizational effectiveness, scoring higher than appraisal and feedback, and just below goal-setting in its effect on productivity. So, let's look at the steps of the training and development process. Training programs typically consist of five steps. The first, or needs analysis step, identifies the specific job performance skills needed, assesses the prospective trainee's skills, and develops specific, measurable knowledge and performance objectives based on any deficiencies. How you analyze training needs depends on whether you're training new or current employees. The main task in analyzing new employees' training needs is to determine what the job requires and then break it down into separate tasks that you then teach to the new employee. On the other hand, analyzing current employees' training needs is more complex since you must first decide whether training is the right solution to the problem. For example, performance may be down because the person isn't motivated and not because she needs training. Once you've decided to train employees and have identified their training needs and goals, you have to design the training program. So, in the second step, instructional design, you decide on the training program content and how to deliver it. Some employers create their own training content, but there is also a vast selection of online and offline content and packages from which to choose. There are also various delivery methods, such as on-the-job training, audio-visual training, simulated training, and computer-based training. You might have a third validation step in your training process, where you work the bugs out of the training program by first presenting it to a small sample audience. This helps guarantee that the training will be effective. The fourth step of training and development programs is to implement the program by actually training the targeted employee group. And finally, in the fifth, or evaluation step of training, managers assess the program's successes or failures. There are actually two basic issues to address when evaluating training programs. The first is the design of the evaluation study. The second issue is, what should we measure? In evaluating the training program, the first question should be how to design the evaluation study. 
Controlled experimentation is the evaluation process of choice. A controlled experiment uses both a training group and a control group that receives no training. You'll obtain data both before and after the group is exposed to training, and before and after a corresponding work period in the control group. This lets you determine whether any changes in performance in the training group actually resulted from the training, rather than from some organization-wide change, like a raise in pay, that would have affected employees in both groups equally. However, although controlled experimentation is the recommended evaluation design, in practice, few firms use it. Most simply measure the trainee's job performance before and after training. But what exactly should you measure? Well, there are four basic categories of training outcomes. First, managers may measure the trainee's reactions to the training program. Did they like the program? Did they think it was worthwhile? In fact, your reaction to training is probably measured every semester when you complete your student evaluation forms. Next, managers may try to measure what the trainees have actually learned. Teachers do this several times throughout the semester by giving exams and homework assignments. They're trying to determine whether their students are learning the material presented in class. Managers may also attempt to measure behavior changes. For example, are employees in the store's complaint department more courteous toward disgruntled customers after having completed a customer service training program? And finally, managers may try to measure results. For instance, did the number of customer complaints decrease after the training? Or did the percentage of calls answered with the required greeting increase? Regardless of the content, delivery, or evaluation method you choose, today's emphasis on measuring the impact of human resource management makes it crucial for managers to make the right training decisions. Potential is one thing, but performance is another. Even high-potential employees can't do their jobs if they don't know what to do or how to do it. So... Employees must be trained, because, let's face it, we don't know everything. That's the end of this section. Section 2, Practice Questions Okay, now that we've reviewed the chapter, let's see how much you've retained. I'll give you a series of multiple-choice, true-false, and essay questions to think about. After a few seconds for each... I'll give you the correct answer and an explanation. Let's start with multiple choice. Ready? Question 1. Orientation typically includes information about employee benefits, personnel policies, and A. Company operations, or B. Detailed salary information. The answer is A. Information about company operations is usually presented to new employees in either a printed or Internet-based employee handbook. Question 2. Trainers can make the learning material more meaningful and memorable by using a variety of examples and A. Minimal visual aids or B. Familiar language. The answer is B. Trainers should use terms and concepts that are already familiar to the trainees. Question 3. To make it easier for trainees to transfer new skills and behaviors from the training site to the job site, trainers should provide adequate practice and A. Maximize the difference between the training situation and the work situation or B. Direct the trainee's attention to important aspects of the job. The answer is B. Direct trainees to important aspects of the job. For example, if you're training customer service representatives to handle incoming calls, first explain the different types of calls they will encounter and how to recognize them. Question 4. Types of on-the-job training, including coaching, special assignments, and A. Job rotation, or B. Job enlargement. The answer is A. With job rotation, employees move from job to job at planned intervals. This process allows employees to learn many different aspects of an organization. Okay, let's try a few true-false questions. Question 5. Training is futile if the trainee lacks ability. True or false? The answer is true. 
For training to be effective, the trainee must have, among other things, the required reading, writing, and mathematical skills, and the required educational level, intelligence, and knowledge base. Question 6. On-the-job training is one of the more expensive training methods. True or false? The answer is false. On-the-job training is relatively inexpensive because trainees learn while producing and don't require expensive off-site facilities like classrooms or programmed learning devices. Question 7. Simulated training is necessary when it's too costly or dangerous to train employees on the job. True or false? The answer is true. For instance, putting assembly line workers right to work could slow production, and when safety is a concern, as with airplane pilots, simulated training may be the only practical alternative. Question 8. With an increasingly diverse workforce, firms no longer have to implement diversity training programs. True or false? The answer is false. As the workforce becomes more diverse, firms are actually spending more time on diversity training, aimed at creating better cross-cultural sensitivity and more harmonious work relationships. How are you doing so far? Ready for some short essay questions? Okay, here's the first of two. Question 9. What are the four goals of orientation training? The four goals of orientation training are to make the new employees feel welcome, help them understand the organization in a broad sense, clarify what is expected in terms of work and behavior, and socialize the new employees into the firm's way of acting and doing things. Last one, question 10. What are the five steps in the training and development process? The five steps in the training and development process are needs analysis, instructional design, validation, implementation, and evaluation. That's the end of this section. Section 3, Key Terms Okay, now we'll review some of the chapter's key terms. I'll give you the term and pause a few seconds while you mentally define it and then I'll come back and state the definition. Ready? Question 1. What is performance management? Performance management is the process employers use to make sure employees are working toward organizational goals. Question 2. Define negligent training. Negligent training is a situation where an employer fails to train adequately and the employee subsequently harms a third party. Question 3. What is task analysis? Task analysis is a detailed study of a job to identify the specific skills required. Question 4. What is performance analysis? Performance analysis is the process of verifying that there is a performance deficiency and determining whether it should be corrected through training or through some other means. Question 5. What is apprenticeship training? Apprenticeship training is a structured process by which people become skilled workers through a combination of classroom instruction and on-the-job training. Question 6. Define programmed learning. Programmed learning is a systematic method for teaching job skills that presents questions or facts, allows the person to respond, and then gives the learner immediate feedback on the accuracy of her answers. Question 7. What is management development? Management development is any attempt to improve current or future management performance by imparting knowledge, changing attitudes, or increasing skills. Question 8. Define action learning. Action learning is a training technique that allows management trainees to work full-time analyzing and solving problems in other departments. 
Question 9. What is the case study method? The case study method is a development method that presents the manager with a written description of an organizational problem to diagnose and solve. Last one, question 10. What is controlled experimentation? Controlled experimentation is a formal method for testing the effectiveness of a training program, preferably by using before and after tests and control groups. That's the end of this section. Section 4, Rapid Review Are you ready for the exam? Let's see. In this section, I'll give you a question and pause for just a few seconds before giving you the answer. Ready? Question 1. What is employee orientation? Employee orientation is a procedure for providing new employees with basic background information about the firm. Question 2. What is on-the-job training? On-the-job training is the process of training a person to learn a job while working on it. Question 3. What are some guidelines for presenting a lecture? Some guidelines for presenting a lecture are don't start off with an irrelevant comment, give your listeners signals, be alert to your audience, maintain eye contact, make sure everyone in the room can hear, control your hands, talk from notes, break up a long talk, and rehearse ahead of time. Question 4. What is an Electronic Performance Support System, or EPSS? An Electronic Performance Support System, or EPSS, is a set of computerized tools and displays that automates training, documentation, and phone support, integrates this automation into applications, and provides support that's faster, cheaper, and more effective than traditional methods. Question 5. What steps can help ensure on-the-job training success? To ensure on-the-job training success, trainers should prepare the learner, present the operation, do a tryout, and follow up on the training. Question 6. What is behavior modeling? Behavior modeling is a training technique that shows trainees good management techniques in a film, asks them to play roles in a simulated situation, and then requires feedback and praise from their supervisor. Question 7. What are intelligent tutoring systems? Intelligent tutoring systems are computerized instruction programs that provide the trainee with guidance and direction while adjusting the suggested instructional sequence to the trainee's unique needs. Question 8. Job aids work well on complex jobs that require multiple steps or where it's dangerous to forget a step. True or false? The answer is true. Question 9. Name some of the forms of distance learning methods for training. Some of the forms of distance learning training methods are correspondence courses, teletraining, video conferencing, and Internet-based courses. Last one, question 10. What is an executive coach? An executive coach is an outside consultant who questions the executive's boss, peers, and subordinates in order to identify the executive's strengths and weaknesses and counsels the executive so he can capitalize on those strengths and overcome the weaknesses. That's the end of this section.